It's promising. It has a good chance of being correct. It's probably the only theory out there that is an actual theory. And I do think understanding this is a kind of a watershed moment in our history. Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. My name is Jesse Lawler. I am your host and I am very excited to bring you episode number 123 in this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your own brain by any and all means at your disposal. First of all, I feel like doing a mic check, make sure that everybody's still here after last week. Last week's episode was an April Fool's episode. We publish on Fridays. April Fool's happened to be on a Friday. I saw it coming months off and I absolutely could not resist. I'm, I'm a sucker for April Fool's jokes and pranks and stuff like that. So hopefully you got the joke. Hopefully you didn't get too far into last week's episode before realizing that something didn't sound quite right. But yeah, the uh, miraculous chakra transplants that we talked about were in fact a complete load of hooey. The couple that I interviewed were actors or actually a husband and wife comedy team. I thought they did a fantastic job. I know that some people really enjoyed the episode. I had a few people that did not enjoy having their leg pulled or at least not a half an hour's worth of leg pulling. So if you're in that camp, hopefully you will forgive me. But this week we are back as usual with a completely legitimate, scientifically credible and what I feel is an extremely awesome interview. Actually, I could not be more excited to have this as sort of a makeup episode with you guys. In the main interview, we'll be talking with Dr. Michael Graziano. He is a professor and neuroscientist at Princeton University, and he's the author of a book that I read last year and then liked so much I went ahead and read it again last year. But the book's name is Consciousness in the Social Brain. I'll introduce it in full in just a couple of minutes, but it's going to be great, and that'll be in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to dig into the origins of April Fool's Day, something which has nothing to do with neuroscience, but is kind of interesting and actually still a item of controversy among historians. It's definitely old, but where it originated is still kind of anyone's guess. But there's some interesting theories, and we'll go into those in the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick. As for now, let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. So I can remember a far side comic that was in the paper when I was a kid, where a sort of doofus looking guy sitting in the back of class raises his hand and asks the teacher, Mr. Teacher, can I be excused? My brain is full. And that's the joke. Now, of course, we all know that brains really don't fill up. But of course, there's been a question of what the theoretical limit of knowledge in a human brain is, or if there is one, and if there's any conceivable way of ever actually hitting that ceiling. New evidence from a study done by the European Molecular Biology Laboratory and the University of Pablo Alavida in Sevilla, Spain, seems to imply that the answer might be no, at least for certain forms of memory, because what their study seems to show is that when the brain is not actively learning, it may be aggressively pruning old and unused memories, potentially trying to clear space for future learning. Said the study's leader, Cornelius Gross, this study is the first time that a pathway in the brain has been linked to forgetting, to actively erasing memories. Working with mice and looking specifically at the hippocampus, a region of the brain that's deeply involved in forming memories, the scientists showed that as memories memories are formed, connections between neurons along a main route within the hippocampus become stronger. This route is called the dentate gyrus granule, and when the cells in this granule were blocked, the mice were not only no longer capable of learning, in this case the learning was sort of a Pavlovian stimulus response trick, the scientists also found the connections in this region weakening, implying that the memory was actually being erased. According to Gross's proposed explanation, there's limited space in the brain, so when you're learning you have to weaken some connections to make room for others. However, this active forgetting only only seem to happen in learning situations. When scientists blocked this main route into the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus granule, under other circumstances, the strength of the neuronal connections there were unaffected. The scientists proposed that this study might eventually lead to drugs that might facilitate forgetting, which could be useful in some cases like dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a couple of five-star reviews this past week on iTunes. Collider Mania said, yay! I'm still pretty new to the show, but so far I'm enjoying it very much. Plus, I wanted a shout-out on the podcast. Well, now you got one. And Pablo Heitmeyer said, Interesting and well-paced with great guests. Perfect for on the way home from the office. Good info and links to authors and companies that I've used to enhance my brain. So thanks to those of you who left reviews and thanks to all of you who are spreading around Smart Drug Smarts on the various corners of the internet. So I must admit, I really did have a good time putting together the fake episode last week, but I, I had some second thoughts too after publishing that. I was just like, oh gosh, is this a little bit, does it sound too much like a real episode? I would love to hear at what point it was that you clued into the fact that, oh, 
oh, this is a joke. Was it immediately obvious that it was an April Fool's thing or did you listen partway in before it clicked that, wait a minute, this couldn't possibly be real? The way that episode came together, believe it or not, the two people interviewed were actors, good friends of one of my good friends who I reached out to saying, hey, you know, I've got this idea. I need to find some actors. I knew he worked with comedy people. So Minnie and Dan are the names of the two actors involved. If you go to smartdrugsmarts.com slash April dash fools, you can actually see what they look like, find out how to link to them and all that stuff. But it was really amazing for me because I actually just told them, hey, you know, I've got this idea. I think it would be really funny to take this idea of chakras and sort of cross pollinate that with the idea of an organ transplant. And they took the ball and ran with it. They did some research. I called them up and, and I actually just interviewed them as I normally would with questions that were ridiculous, but I had no idea what their answers were going to be. So it really was a improvisational interview that was cut together. Anyway, we, we will not be doing that to you again, but thanks to everyone for being a good sport. So on to more reality. We've got a weekly newsletter for Smart Drug Smarts. We call that the Brain Breakfast. If you haven't signed up for that yet, I will encourage you to do so. That's at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter. And one of the things I could not bring myself to talk about on last week's episode, I did not want to in any way mix commerce with fake non-scientific material. So last week you may have noticed I did not mention Axon Labs at all. But this week I will. In my system right now and about five days out of six are the supplement stacks that we have over at axonlabs.io. Nexus and Mitogen. Powerful stuff for your brain. Nexus is based around aniracetam, phosphatidylserine, CDP choline, and pycnogenol. We've touched on all of those to one extent or another in previous episodes, so I won't go into detail now except to say that it is some good stuff. Great for working memory, anti-anxiety, and long-term neuroprotection. And you can find those over at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. We get you thinking. So there are probably two fundamentally complex and controversial questions in the universe that people have been rolling and rolling and rolling over in their minds forever trying to figure out answers to. And generally, the only answers that people can come up with involve either some form of magic or a frustrating admission that we just don't know and it's really hard to figure out how we would gain the ability to know. One of those is why there is something rather than nothing. The answer to which is not, well, because there was a Big Bang or because God said so, is kind of the question before that question of why is there a set of rules in which a Big Bang is a potential outcome, or who put God there so he could dictate the rest, depending on what your flavor of astrotheology is. Anyway, so that's one of the questions, and that's the question we will not be getting to in this episode. The other big question is what is this thing we call consciousness? And one of the things that makes consciousness incredibly difficult to talk about is the lack of a consistent definition. There's all sorts of reasons for that, but the basic issue that is so difficult to wrestle with is why does it feel like something to exist? Why do our mechanistic behaviors as animals machines come along with this sense of being present, of looking out at a reality, of having an experience rather than just behaving robotically. You could imagine in sort of a clockwork universe Newtonian mechanics way, if you knew every atom in your body, all the speeds, all the momentums, all the positions, you could kind of game out exactly what you would do. And you could easily imagine a universe where that's how people are, that's how animals are. You have this highly, highly complex mechanistic thing that would exist and go through the motions and do all the things that you see human beings doing, but wouldn't have the sense of a holistic awareness that there's somebody behind the controls that I'm taking in these sensory inputs, I'm making the decisions, I'm driving the train here. Anyway, it's a big, sticky, messy, sloppy issue. And it's been driving people crazy forever. This is where the, you know, sort of divine spark of the immortal soul is called into action. If you're looking at it from a religious perspective, if you're looking at it from a scientific rationalist perspective, most of the speculations that are out there are, are deeply unsatisfying. Things like consciousness being this epiphenomenon that takes place on top of the mechanisms of our brain, analogous to the way that waste heat comes off a fire or something like that. Enter Dr. Michael Graziano. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Princeton and has spent a great deal of time working on the study of the cerebral cortex and how it monitors the space around the body. Now, as he describes in his book, Consciousness and the Social Brain, over the course of years and decades working in this field and thinking about all these issues, he began coming up. It sounds like it didn't really strike all in one giant flash of insight, like Newton getting hit on the head with an apple. But Dr. Graziano has come up with a theory on what conscious awareness might actually be, what it's for, why it exists, and how it could be explained without resorting to things like immortal souls. Now, full disclosure, this is not the world's most actionable episode of Smart Drug Smarts that we've ever had, except insofar that you might be curious about why you have conscious awareness. And what you're about to hear might be a plausible explanation. So buckle up. If you're commuting while you listen to this, you might want to pull over in case your mind gets blown. Here we go with Dr. Michael Graziano. What is consciousness? It's a very broad question, very philosophical question. People have been asking it, obviously, for thousands of years. And one of the ways people have conceptualized it these days is there's kind of two different meanings of the word consciousness. 
that people tend to use. And one is this very general sense of everything in my mind at any particular moment. My consciousness is my concept of who I am and where I am and my knowledge of mortality and all kinds of other things like that that we think of as bundled together in one's consciousness. That's what one way, almost like the more popular approach to consciousness. But there's another way to think of it, and that is not so much the content of consciousness, not what it is that you're conscious of, but how you get to be conscious of it. No matter what it is, whether you're talking about something as complicated as your self-knowledge or whether you're talking about something as simple as a color, well, you look at something red, the color red, somehow you have a subjective experience of it. And what is that experiencedness? What is subjectiveness? What is that kind of pared down consciousness? And that has sometimes been called the hard problem. It's been called the hard problem because how do you study it? How do you even approach it scientifically? How do you think about it? It's private. So how can you do an experiment on it? How can you share data? So it's been labeled the hard problem, which is a euphemism for the utterly impossible problem. Right. And then, of course, there's the easy problem, which is how everything else in the brain works, which is obviously also a euphemism for the really hard, but in principle, at least it's tractable. Right, exactly. So that's kind of the hard problem. How do you get to have that subjective experience? You know, terminology, as you mentioned, is is one of the hardest things to deal with here because we have a whole lot of sort of semi-overlapping and fuzzily defined terms. Like, I think the three biggest ones that you cover in your book, which I, I felt like you did a great job of defining to the point where they can be talked about without muddying the waters, were attention, awareness, and consciousness. And maybe that might be a good preamble for this discussion. If you could kind of give your your definition. So as we use those terms, people will know specifically what we mean. Sure. So those terms are certainly used in lots of different ways, and other people may even use them synonymously with each other. And so I certainly don't claim to have the right definitions of those words, but I try to clearly define at least what I mean by them. So attention, I take a definition that comes from neuroscience, and it's a very technical, specific definition, and it it has almost nothing to do with what most people would think of colloquially as attention. It's a data handling method. It's a mechanistic process. So the brain takes in way too many signals to process in depth at any one time. It has to limit itself and focus its resources. And it does that by competition. Signals compete with each other. And that competition results in some signals kind of bubbling up to the top and and taking resources and other signals being pressed down and suppressed. And those signals that win the competition are more deeply processed. They have a bigger impact on our behavior. They're more likely to be stored in memory. And those are the things that are being attended. That's what attention is. And one of the most important points about attention in this definition is it's really not mysterious. It's buildable. People have built that into computer systems. So it's a mechanistic, entirely engineerable data handling trick that the brain uses. Right. Yeah. In that sense, you could have a like a video camera wired up that pays attention to when something red appears and it, it sort of ignores all the other color spectrum. But when something red shows up, you could have an alarm go off. And, and so that would be something which nobody would think has a sense of self-awareness, but is paying attention to the color red in that case. Exactly. Or you could have quite a sophisticated video camera that scans an area. But if something's moving, it hones right in on the movement and cuts out everything else. Right. So that would be a very useful case of a basically artificial attention. It's signal enhancement, basically. It's selective signal enhancement. So that's attention. Now, you asked about awareness, and many people use awareness and consciousness synonymously. And I kind of like the word awareness because it's slightly, it has fewer definitions. People tend to agree more or less on what it means, although there is still some diversity there. But by awareness, I mean subjective experience. So I can attend to something, I can attend to my coffee mug in this technical sense that my brain is focusing resources on it. That doesn't mean I'm aware of it, (laughs) because the awareness means I have a subjective experience of it. And those are two separate concepts. So if you're attending to your coffee cup, let's say you picked it up, you've decided, you know, I'm going to pick up my coffee to drink it. But meanwhile, you're reading the paper and really the focus of your awareness might be on the paper, but you are giving some sliver of attention to the coffee cup because you've drank it without spilling it on yourself. Right. It certainly requires focused, attentive processing to handle a coffee cup. And you may be totally unaware you're doing it. Right. I mean, another good example that I like that particularly stands out is driving when you're driving home on some really familiar road 
and you have to pay attention to signs and other drivers. That is, you have to have a selective enhancement of this set of signals over that one, and you have to make the right decisions. And you drive all the way home, and it's been half an hour, and suddenly you realize, whoa, I had no idea I was doing that. My mind was somewhere else. Yeah. So you can definitely attend to things without being aware of them. That's almost a great definition. What you said there is awareness is kind of where your mind is. It's where your subjective mind is. It's all about subjective experience. And attention is all about what signals are being enhanced and deeply processed in the brain. And those are not necessarily the same thing. In fact, there's a whole industry right now in neuroscience of showing how you can have attention without awareness. It's a really interesting area of research. Yeah. Maybe if you want to go into that for a minute, just to paint that picture for people, because some of them are, are profoundly unintuitive. Well, so it was first discovered, this split between them was first discovered in something called blind sight. And that's a really wild phenomenon all unto itself. Blind sight, what's going on there, there's an area of the cortex the visual cortex, the primary visual cortex. And when it gets damaged, you're blind. You can't see. And a researcher in sort of the middle 20th century, Alan Cowie, discovered that when you're blind because of damage to that cortex, that visual cortex, you say you can't see, but you actually can kind of see. You can have people who walk through a room without bumping into things as though they can see the obstacles. <laughs> but there's no, they would tell you that they can't see. That's correct. Somehow unconscious to their experience, they're managing to dodge these things. That's right. And a more typical case, you have damage in a small area of the visual world. So you're blind there, or at least you say you're blind there, and you sit in front of a screen and the experimenter flashes an image in that blind part of the visual field and then says, you know, was it one dot or two dots? And this person says, what are you kidding? I'm blind. Why are you even bothering to ask? And the experimenter has to kind of gently nudge the person. Well, just guess, you know, uh -huh. just guess. And they tend to guess correctly. So visual information is getting in, but you're not even remotely aware of it. And this is much more recently. What emerged is that not only does the information get in, but you can actually prioritize it and focus attention on it and process it in a way that shows that information is one a competition among signals and is being deeply processed. In other words, you're attending to stuff yeah. that you're blind to. And that was where this, this first began, this attention without awareness. Now, it went on as people began to think, well, th does this happen in people with an intact brain? And yes, it happens to all of us. And there are many, many studies now where, well, just to give you an example, so these are sometimes very stripped down experiments that are taken into the lab where somebody looks at a computer screen and a dot flashes really briefly, very dimly, and you're not even aware that it's there. But after the dot flashes, then there's a letter that's presented on the screen, you know, mm -hmm. like an N or a T or something. And your job is to say what the letter is as quickly as possible. And it turns out you are faster to report that letter if that little invisible dot appeared right at that same location, just a moment before the letter appeared. Wow. And so that dot is drawing your attention to that spot on the screen sure, so that you can better process the subsequent stimulus. And it does that even though you say you didn't see it, you're unaware of it. So it's attention without awareness. Studies like that just make me even more skeptical than I would otherwise be about all sorts of like extrasensory phenomena and things that people think are, you know, some sort of magic. It's just like the fact that our brains are doing all this work beneath the surface of what we're aware of. It seems like it can probably explain a great number of really weird, otherwise seeming spooky things. Yes. And actually, most of what the brain does is outside awareness. I mean, really, this vast amount of just the talk about an iceberg effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even people who study that typically don't really have a good grasp of just how much is outside of awareness. And of course, the reason is you're not aware of it. Right. Yeah. Definitionally, it's hard to approach. Yes. So I had a friend. He was a, a therapist. He told me about a patient of his, a, uh, a psychiatric patient who had a delusion. This man thought that he had a squirrel in his head instead of a brain. And this is a little bizarre, but as is typical with these delusions, you couldn't argue this guy out of his belief. So he was set on it. You could say, well, that's illogical. That's irrational. And he would say, yep, that's true. But uh, some things transcend logic. 
transcend rationality. He just had like, it was intuitively obvious to him that there was a squirrel in the head. Evidence be damned. It was primary truth given to him that he had a squirrel in his head. And you could say, well, look, let me explain. You don't really have a squirrel. Your brain has constructed information that describes a squirrel in your head. And you're kind of captive to that information. The brain is stuck with the information it has. And so you arrive at this conclusion and you arrive at a high degree of certainty that it's true. And you could explain all that to him and he just sort of roll his eyes and say, yeah, information, computation, yada, yada, you're just throwing words at me. And that's a really lousy explanation because you still haven't explained how the squirrel got in my head. How does a squirrel emerge from computation? It's like nonsense. Right? Yeah. And so nothing you could say would convince him. And to me, I loved that when I heard that because that's an almost perfect encapsulation of the issue of consciousness and, and the controversies around consciousness. Most theories of consciousness are dedicated to asking, how does the squirrel get in the head? What generates the squirrel? Right. With the analogy being to everybody's sort of default assumptions about consciousness being kind of this magical, divorced from physics and biochemistry kind of magical experience. That's right. And the fact is, I can't explain the magic, but I think we can explain how the machine in our heads insists that there is magic. And that's explainable. And we can explain why that kind of self-description is adaptive, why it would have evolved in the first place, what role it plays in cognition. Yeah. And, and even what specific brain networks might be involved in computing that kind of information. So now that we've laid that groundwork and we did the, the earlier definitions of attention and awareness, can you kind yes. of pull the pieces together now and, and give the crux of your theory? Sure. It's, I could summarize it in a very few words. Awareness is a kind of cartoon sketch of attention. And, you know, that's the theory. Yeah. It requires unpacking, of course. But one of the key points here is that the brain constructs descriptions. They're called models, internal models, basically simulations. The brain constructs simulations of things in the world that are important to monitor and predict. So we look around the world, our visual system constructs these simulations of the visual world, objects, coffee cups, people, whatever. It's a very rich description, color, shape, three-dimensional structure, all of this is being reconstructed in the brain in our visual systems. Right. The brain constructs models of our bodies. It's called the body schema. It constructs internal models of everything. And one of the things that it models is its own internal computational processes. So the brain constructs models of what it means to pay attention to something. Mm -hmm. And the center of this theory is this realization that the brain constructs an attention schema. It's an internal model of attention. It's the brain's kind of quick and dirty cartoonish description of what it means to attend to something. Right. So the same as you can close your eyes, but still have a good sense of where your fingers and toes are, and that's information being processed in your brain, you could also introspect on what you are cognitively attending to. Yes. What you're attending to, what it means to pay attention, what the consequences of attention are, even what some of the dynamics of attention are, how it shifts from place to place over time. All of this information needs to be represented somewhere in the brain. Yes. So we have this internal model. The brain is captive to those internal models. The only thing it knows about the world comes from those internal models. We don't have direct access to anything in the world. All we have is information reconstructed by the brain. And we go on that information. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like when people think of model, you think of like the ship built inside of a coffee cup or a jar or something like that and like a very simplistic thing. But the, the models we're talking about here are incredibly complex. And whereas like our visual model of the world, we can kind of study what the real outside triggers are for that. With attention, we don't have something that's nearly as hard and fast that we can say, well, here is what is being modeled. And I, th I think that's probably what makes it so much less intuitively obvious that this might be an in information schema. Yes, I think that's exactly why it was so hard to crack that problem. So I'll give you an example of an easier problem that was cracked quite a few hundred years ago, did actually cause people a lot of trouble, and that's the nature of the color white. Before Newton figured out that white was a mixture of all colors, the assumption was that it's pure brightness without any contaminating colors. That's what white is. It was intuitively obvious. People asked a question, you might call it the hard problem of optics, <laughs> that 
how does white light get pure? What purifies it? Or to ask the question another way, what dirty contaminant do you have to add to turn it into red light or green light? These were the questions people were asking. They were totally unanswerable questions because they were based on an incorrect concept. And the reason why they were incorrect is because this information was derived from evolutionarily built-in, simplified model constructed in the visual system. It's a simple cartoon sketch of the visual world. And in that cartoon sketch, there's no such thing as a reflectance spectrum. There's no such thing as a spectrum of light. Instead, there's this simpler property, color. Color is a construct of the brain. And in that simplified model, white is high brightness, low color. Yeah. That's how our visual systems reconstruct white. So relying on that introspection, an internal model led to this completely incorrect concept of what white light is. Now, Newton figured it out, and since then, with some reluctance, (laughs) it was quite controversial at the time, actually, but with some reluctance, scientists eventually had to accept that. And now we all know, intellectually at least, that white is a mixture of all colors. And what's amazing about that is despite knowing it and everybody sort of agreeing on it intellectually, it doesn't make white feel any different to us. That's right. We are stuck with that evolutionarily built-in model in our visual systems. It is what it is. When we introspect, we will always get that answer because that's the information being constructed in our brains. And I think it's the same thing with conscious experience. We may know at an intellectual level that this is just information computed in the system, but when we introspect, we'll always get the same answer. Which is actually kind of a promising result. Like it makes you feel good. People sometimes worry, well, like if we study the mechanics of of love, for example, that we'll, we'll somehow be demystifying it and it won't feel as magical. But when we think about that in the context of color, white still looks like white. It still looks like the absence of color, despite knowing what it is and how it works. And there's probably no reason to think that it might not be the same, even as we further clarify what's going on within our subjective experience. I think that's exactly right. Yes. One of the biggest problems with previous theories of consciousness, almost all of them, but not quite all of them, is that they're not really theories. (laughs) And they're not theories because they're not explanatory. One of the key things they don't explain is how we can articulate the fact that we have it. And here's an example. The brain has neurons and synapses and blood flow and all kinds of things in there. That doesn't mean that we can introspect and say, oh, yep, I got me some neurons today. Right. Just because we have it in there doesn't mean that it's accessible to us to talk about. And almost all theories of consciousness are focused on this question, how do we get it? How does it appear in the brain? Mm-hmm. But they manage to forget that there's this other side to the question. Just because you have it in there doesn't mean that you can say you have it. Yeah, you couldn't introspect and say that you have a neuron any more than you could introspect and say that you have a squirrel. Exactly. Right. So, for example, to go back to the squirrel in the head guy, let's say you actually did stick a squirrel in his head. That doesn't explain why he claims there's a squirrel in his head. Right. <laughs> it's actually it's a very poor explanation. So most theories of consciousness, which are focused on this question of uh, how we get the magic in there, okay, let's just pretend that the magic did get in there. That still doesn't explain why we're walking around talking about having it in there. And so that's what I call the arrow A, arrow B. Arrow A is what everyone is focused on. How does a brain produce consciousness? But that does you no good unless you also have the arrow B, which is how does this consciousness thing you're talking about have a direct mechanistic physical impact on neurons in the brain, causing them to lead to your speech circuitry to say, I have consciousness. That seems like it really puts a knife in the heart of of most of the other theories. Well, yeah, like I said, most of them actually aren't really theories, but it's a very hard problem to tackle. So maybe it's not surprising that there's so many non-theories surrounding it. How is the response to this theory, which I think you wrote about it a few times prior to your book, but how is the response been now that the idea has been out in the wild for a year or so? I'd say it's gaining ground. I'd say that there are, in psychology and neuroscience, I think people are primed for this particular way of thinking. I mean, there's a hundred years of research that indicates the brain is a big information processing machine. And when that machine ups and says, I have magic inside of me, as scientists, we can ask, how did it arrive at that self-description? And what are the networks involved in computing that information? And what's the adaptive value of computing that type of self-description? I mean, you can ask a lot of questions about that. And that approach, that way of thinking makes a lot of sense, I think, to psychologists and neuroscientists in general. And so in that crowd, this idea has been, I think, gaining ground. There's a, a lot of people very interested in it. But of course, a theory needs a lot of data. 
not just one or two experiments, but many, many experiments, probably over decades before anyone, including myself, really feels comfortable that this is the right answer. How much do you feel like computer science and artificial intelligence programming might be able to mechanistically help prove or disprove this idea? I think it will play the crucial role. Well, to back up a little bit, typically big ideas that are very theoretical don't make much impression on most people unless they become really of practical significance. And just to name one of the most obvious ones, you know, the ancient Greeks figured out that the earth is round. Very few people believed it or cared about it until the age of global exploration, right. when suddenly it became practically important. And here's another standout case. Even today, many people, apparently more than half the population of the U.S., does not believe in evolution except when it applies to germs. And suddenly everyone believes in the evolution of germ. Right. Germ evolution, everyone understands. It's, it's something that's of such practical significance. Everyone kind of grasps the concept. But kind of this macro evolution of larger species, including ourselves, you know, it really doesn't affect the average guy. What does he care? So I figure these deep philosophical questions about consciousness are uninteresting to most people until, and this I think is going to happen very soon, until they hit the artificial intelligence scene and they become something that's integral to our society. And suddenly it becomes of such practical significance that people gain intuitions about it. I think what's going to happen is we build this stuff and suddenly we have computers that are acting like we do. And suddenly we're faced with this uh, realization that we're just machines too. And when we talk to another machine that says, yeah, I'm conscious and, and describes it in the same ways we do and behaves in the same ways we do and can introspect and report the contents of introspection in the same ways we do, at that point, our natural empathy <laughs> takes over. And we say to ourselves, yep, it's conscious. Yeah, it's going to be really weird because ultimately we have to take you know, the other party's word for it when we're talking about consciousness. It's like if I'm skeptical of a computer or an AI program that says, yep, I'm conscious, I really, by all rights, I should be skeptical of my friends that tell me the same thing. Yeah, but here's the really gnarly part of it that's very hard for people to wrap their minds around. Most people think exactly like you just described. Well, I know I'm conscious, but I have to take their word for it. But the truth is, you kind of have to take your own word for it that you're conscious. You have to, it's a leap of faith to believe your own introspection. Right. And that becomes particularly obvious in cases like the guy with the squirrel in his head, because there's plenty of cases where people's intuitions fail them and they have all kinds of strange delusions. So there's no reason to trust yourself, let alone trust the other people. So that's actually a great entry point to defining that third term that we never put a strict definition on yet, which is consciousness. And your, your book's title is Consciousness and the Social Brain. And yes. maybe explicating that last term would now would be a great time. Well, I find the word consciousness a difficult one because so many people mean different things by it. And often people mean exactly what I mean by awareness, the experience, the inner subjective experience. Right. And that's fine for people to use it that way, in which case, whether I'm talking about awareness or consciousness, it's all a theory of, of how the brain concludes it has that. One of the really interesting things about consciousness, at least for humans, is that we tend to think of it as the private thing. I mean, philosophers think of it as a private experience. But one of the main ways that we use that concept of consciousness is attributing it to other people. It's an integral part of us as social beings. We attribute awareness and consciousness and mental states to other people. And of course, we attribute it to more than just people. We're such social creatures. We're so attuned socially that we have this tendency to attribute consciousness to everything. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous in the case of people. But we attribute consciousness to our pets, which is reasonable. Some people swear their house plants are conscious. I got mad at my computer the other day. Right. Little kids have teddy bears and imaginary friends. and Exactly. And in my perspective, the whole range of the spirit world, from deities to ghosts, these are attributions of consciousness to things or even empty spaces around us. This is kind of what we do as social beings, this yeah. part of our brain that models the mind states of other people is hyperactive. <laughs> And so, yes, in this sense, we're attributing consciousness to ourselves, attributing it to other people. And yes, the ventriloquism effect is, is a particularly good one. I like that because it highlights the distinction between 
knowing intellectually versus feeling intuitively, right? Because you know intellectually that dumb piece of cloth has no brain. (laughs) Yeah, but it's so easy to let yourself sort of get caught up in the magic. And I mean, you know, movies and everything else are the same way. You can watch a cartoon and think of these flashes of light as having internal experience when you know consciously they don't. Of course, sometimes in real life that gets mixed up in really bizarre ways. I mean, some of the kind of heartbreaking instances of people who are in coma like, you know, the famous Terry Schiavo case. Right. Now, there's a case where there's ambiguity, whether you're projecting consciousness onto someone or whether that someone has the capability to project it onto themselves. And these cases can be very ethically murky and very difficult. In that case, it was the husband that thought that for all intents and purposes, she was beyond consciousness. She was intellectually dead, whereas her family thought that there was still consciousness there, you know, even though she was unresponsive. Yes. Well, to them, she was. But the whole point of this theory is that we don't look at each other and intellectually figure out, oh, his neurons are enhancing the sandwich signal. (laughs) We don't really attribute attention, mechanistic attention attention to each other. What we do is come up with a much simpler kind of cartoon sketch of it. And we say, he's aware of the sandwich. He's, his mind is focused on the sandwich. Yeah. It's almost like you could see the imaginary little dotted lines going out of one person's eyes to the yes. sandwich and things like yes, that. Exactly. And that's a great simplifying trick to think of awareness as this sort of invisible thing that comes out of the eyes, right? It may be physically wrong, but it's a great simplifying trick that makes it easy to make predictions about the other person. And so now we have this case where we're attributing this mystical property to another person in a way that's really useful because I can predict your behavior better. And if it's useful to predict your behavior, think how much more useful it is for me to predict my own behavior. Yeah. So it's really useful to apply those same kinds of models and attributions to oneself. Once it becomes adaptive in that way, you could see why tripling the size of our cerebral cortex over the past couple of million years, a lot of those resources are apparently around building this rich internal model that leads to subjective experiences that we now have. Yes, I think that's right. And humans are crazy in this respect. We attribute awareness at the drop of a hat. Yeah, you literally, you you know, draw a circle with a couple of dots and, and a curved line on the inside of it. And hey, it's a smiley face. And hey, that smiley face is happy. So it's like you've drawn two lines in a dot. Yes, yes, exactly. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very, very much to Dr. Michael Graziano for taking the time for that interview. Again, his book is Consciousness and the Social Brain. We'll put up a link to that at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 123. And I could not recommend that one more highly. Like probably a lot of you, I've got a book list of things that I'm meaning to get to reading that is embarrassingly long. And I actually took the time to read that book twice, which is indicative of what a good book I thought it was, how interesting I thought it was, and how some of the ideas were profound enough that I wanted to sort of go back and, and chew on them a second time. Do not be surprised if one day, many years from now, the consensus view as to what conscious awareness is has actually converged around Dr. Graziano's theory. And you can say, I heard that guy talking on Smart Drug Smarts way back in 2016. I I would not be at all surprised. Predictions are a dangerous thing. We all know that. But his is a very plausible theory. But now let's move on to the history of April Fool's Day in the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So April Fool's Day, we are a couple of days into April now as I record this. As I mentioned last week's episode, although the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick and the This Week in Neuroscience were both real, the actual interview last week was total hogwash. I am to blame for it. It was a dirty trick that I could not resist pulling. And maybe the most amazing thing about it is that within just a couple of hours of having published that episode, we ranked number one on Google for chakra transplants. And as of today, we still do. Probably will for a great while to come. But so April Fool's Day, this custom of doing dastardly tricks to one another on the 1st of April. What is it? Where did it come from? It's it's not a religious holiday. There's nothing particularly holy or reverent about it, but it seems to be very old. There was actually a letter to the editor in a 1708 British magazine. So over 300 years ago, somebody asking the editor of that magazine, whence proceeds the custom of making April Fool's? So even back then, people were wondering, over 300 years ago. One of the first potential references to it was actually by Ch 
Chaucer in some of his writings from the 14th century, but it's a pretty oblique reference, and it's it's not quite clear that that's what he's talking about. But by the 1500s, there are numerous written references to the custom of April Fools both on the European continent and in Britain. It seems like there are several different countries that would each like to take credit for originating the holiday. Apparently, the holiday's got some fans other than me. One potential origin story is from France, where they were on a different calendar from much of the rest of Europe for a long time, where their year ended not at the end of December, but at the end of March. And eventually, in 1564, France reformed its calendar, sort of fall into line with everybody else, and start their year on January 1st. But there were pockets of resistance or people that just didn't get the memo. They kept their calendars starting at the 1st of April, and eventually these holdouts started having pranks played on them. The people that thought they were behind the times would cut fake fish out of paper and stick them to these people's backs. This type of prankery was called being an April fish, and apparently this is still the term used in France. They say April fish, or the French version of that, rather than April Fools. Organizing something like when the calendar year starts is actually a really big problem historically. There was a general consensus in the Middle Ages that it would make sense to start the calendar year on some sort of date of religious significance, and Easter was used in some calendars. That The problem with that was that because Easter's always on a Sunday, that meant years had to be some multiple of seven days long, or else you couldn't have a seven-day week, and it led to craziness. It led to calendar days slipping and years getting too long and yada, yada, yada. Eventually, they kind of gave up on the idea of trying to tie it to a religious holiday, and most parts of Europe started going with January 1st, which, by the way, in a bit of a stretch to try to tie that to something historically religious, they said was the date of Jesus's circumcision. Bet you didn't know that. But there are other scholars that think that the origin of the holiday is much, much older. Some say that it goes back as far as Roman and Greek mythology. If you remember the myth of Hades and Persephone, Persephone was stolen by the god of the dead and taken down to the underworld, and her mom was justifiably upset, and as if I remember the story correctly, the reason that we have winter is because that's when her mom is like has six months of the year where she doesn't have her daughter and spends that time not minding the world's weather. But some scholars say that the fruitless search by Persephone's mom for her daughter was remembered by sending people on fool's errands on on April 1st, and that that might be the origin of the holiday. There's a far less mythological story from 1530s Germany, when there was a meeting of lawmakers that was supposed to take place in the city of Augsburg to discuss financial matters, but some of the financial speculators were apparently betting on whether or not the meeting would actually take place. It wound up not taking place, and the people that bet that it would and lost their money were ridiculed. According to some Germans, this meeting that was supposed to take place on April 1st is actually the origin of the holiday. Long story short is there are so many competing theories on where April Fool's Day came from, it's almost as if various people throughout history have decided decided to have their own April Fool's Day on historians, coming up with false but inventive origin stories for the holiday itself. We'll not be getting to the bottom of it here, but hopefully this gives you just a little bit of inspiration for next year's prankery. We like to think of ourselves as a digital speakeasy for brain hackers, but you can call us smart drug smarts. Okay, you heard it. That is the entire episode number 123. You can find that online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 123 if you're interested in finding the links to any of the things that we talked about here. I hope this week's episode gave you a lot to think about. One of the things we've heard time and time again is that simply wrestling with new and unfamiliar ideas can do a lot to improve a person's cognition, keep their brain from getting rusty as it were. And there's no better way to get your brain arm wrestling with itself than to get into the process of metacognition, thinking about thinking. So keep Keep your neurons buzzing about that. Do not get your thoughts wrapped around the axle, but take some time to enjoy the deep thoughts. Reminder that we've got that newsletter at smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter if you're looking for a little bit of a brain injection of reading material over the course of the week. If you missed last week's episode, you want to hear the highly controversial April Fool's edition of Smart Drug Smarts. That was Smart Drug Smarts number 122 featuring entirely fictional chakra transplants. And next week, we'll be getting back to our roots, looking at an actual substance, an actual supplement, cannabidiol. It is one of the psychoactive cannabinoid compounds inside the marijuana plant. And we'll be talking about that with a big fan of cannabidiol, Ben Greenfield, biohacker, Ironman athlete, fitness expert extraordinaire. That'll be coming up next week in episode number 124. So I will see you back here then, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.